Hello and welcome back to the October weekly Astro update. We're here for the week of the 16th to the 23rd of October, going from Wednesday to Wednesday to honour our good friend Hermes. My name's Sonia from Celestial Astrology and I'm here with my very good friend Shauna. Hi Shauna. Hi. Hi. Would you like to introduce yourself Shauna? I'm Shauna. I'm from smartastro.com. You can find me on Substack, Instagram and Twitter at the same handle. Brilliant. Thank you so much for joining me. It's lovely to go through the astrology of this week with you. And Shauna's here channeling Chris Brennan. <laughs> I figure I'll keep it up for October. Yeah. So this is the month of October. So we're going from the 16th. Venus trining Neptune, full moon in Aries, sun Scorpio. And that's it. Not a lot of astrology going on this week, but some major stuff with the full moon in Aries there and the sun changing signs. So this is how the week looks broken down. Venus trining Neptune, of course, Neptune is retrograde in Pisces. And on the 17th, we've got the full moon in Aries. Venus entering Sagittarius and the sun entering Scorpio. And as in the previous weeks, I've chosen the three main transits of the week to focus in on. So because the trines are easy, I've left that out and I've focused in on the full moon, the ingress of Venus into Sagittarius and the ingress of the sun into Scorpio. How does this week look for you, Shauna? And do you agree with those choices? Yeah, I think they look great. What do you think of this week? How does it look? You're going to be on holiday this week. Is that okay to mention? Yeah, it's okay. We should be tying up our vacation during these transits. So we'll see how that goes. Yeah. That'd be nice. And I'm hoping to be meeting one of our art co-founders during this time where we are all used to working very well online and virtually and, and hopefully I'll be meeting one of us in person so that's going to be yeah. exciting yeah so we go straight into the full moon in and so we've got the wild way oracle deck showing the decan that the full moon occurs in and it's in aries three and the wild way oracle deck by nicola allen has entitled it feed your desires so it's very much about what do you desire what are you searching for and how do you feed it and she's given us the keywords here of fiery charm power of art and creativity and charisma. And this is in Cardinal, Fire and Air. And we notice that it's conjunct Chiron in Aries. So there's that healing element as well. And it's also co-present with the North Node in Aries. But far enough away that it isn't an eclipse this time. There's a T-square with Mars in Cancer, so that's bringing some tension from Cancer and with Pluto in Capricorn. So although that's wide, it's almost forming like a cardinal cross, they would call it. So that's like coming into effect as Mars moves forward, but it is wide. It's not, it's not full or exact, but it's, it's a whole sign. Cross. The moon is sextile Jupiter in Gemini and the sun is trining Jupiter, so it's bringing in that energy that we talked about last week of the retrograde Jupiter in Gemini. And Aries 3 as a Deccan is co-ruled by Jupiter and Venus as the Deccan rulers in both the Triplicity and the Chaldean, which are two different methods of looking at the rulership, but they're both the benefic planets. So that's one reason why I see this moon and this lunation as quite a benefic one, quite a nice one. Some Moons are more challenging, and there certainly is challenging aspects there with the squares to Mars and Pluto. And this is about, like Kira Ryberg calls this Deccan creation, and Austin Coppick calls it Rose on Fire, which is a bit more, brings some darkness in maybe, that there's some element of destruction there to something beautiful that has been set on fire, but it's also the heat of passion maybe the beauty of the rose and the intensity of the desire for it. And the tarot card that it corresponds with is the four of wands. So we're looking here at the power of art and the creativity and the charisma that goes in following those desires. And we see the fox here, the Aries three fox, and he's 
joyfully bursting onto a stage. I mean, it almost looks like his, it's his pause, but I, every time I look at it, I see a microphone in his hand, <laughs> like he's singing, performing to us. It's like he's got a burning passion, courageous authenticity, and it feels like it's time to go and fan the flames of your creativity in order to inspire and motivate those around you. Like, Aries is very much the leader, the pioneer, finding the the hard edges around things. Aries will go right up to that edge and find where that edge is for the rest of us. Um, and to create something beautiful, sometimes you need to turn up that heat. And the intensity of this moment is all that matters for the fire. will soon die down and return to embers. So when you see a fire, you know that it burns strong and it burns fast, but it doesn't always burn forever. It does go. So there's, there's a fleeting moment and the opportunity for glory is now. So you have to be sure to add the fuel to your fire and also to grab it when it's there. Um, so take your moment. If you see your opportunity, take it. And that's what this full moon is teaching us. And it was really interesting when I looked at the stars and the asteroids as well for this lunation, because we see that the sun is conjunct the fixed star speaker at 24 Libra. And this star is one of the most fortunate stars. Um, it's symbolic of the all nourishing earth of the mother and the bountiful harvest. And she offers us goodwill and opportunities. She brings luck and protection. And then we also see the moon is conjunct the asteroid Eris, which is feminine empowerment. She was thought to be the sister goddess of Mars, the goddess of strife and discord, bringing adversity. She might have been in mythology. She gave Eve that first pop. She caused problems with Helen of Troy. She was always the one who showed us the problems by bringing the conflict in. But also that shows where the problems were. So this is very much about female empowerment through where is the argument? Where do we need to fight for ourselves? Um, so there is a positive energy here and an, a resourcefulness, but you have to be willing to stand up for yourself. You have to be willing to advocate for other women maybe who aren't as strong. And I've seen that working in a client that I was working with um, that showed up in her chart and it was other women that she had advocated before and we saw that that was coming back round again and that was indeed the case. Um, so we were able to identify that because that goddess was um, showing up and it's about allowing yourself to follow your desires as well. So seeing where they show up and where there is a tension or a healing or a purging needed and where empowerment's needed. So seeing that for yourself as well as for others. Um, so that's what I'm seeing with this full moon. I, I think overall it's benefic, but also being aware of that square to Mars. Mars is also about female empowerment, I feel, in, in Cancer. Mm. Mars has got sight of the moon, it's real, so that helps Mars know what it needs to do. And Mars is the ruler of the moon. So it helps that it's got sight as well. So what what how do you feel, Shauna? Yeah, we've got mutual reception between the two. So that's definitely going to ease things a little bit. Doubling back to the Four of Wands, it's, um, the Four of Wands is, is a celebratory card. It usually like makes you think of the springtime wedding or, you know, you've got a little cabin fever. Maybe you're finally getting outdoors in those first warmer days and, you know, where you're throwing on the light jacket or you're realizing the middle of the day, it's time to take that off, you know, or when the kids, you know, they're playing at the park and they're throwing their jackets off. And, but it also, it's supported by the the major cards of the emperor and the empress. And that really draws in that partnership factor, which is a nice reflection with the full moon also. And then also with the, the mutual reception from the Mars to the, you know, Mars and the, um, I think um, it also is really nice having just had that Jupiter trine so there may be that tension in that T-square, but um, I think overall it's going to be much more positive. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's one of those things that there's never a case when everything, it's like if you watch a movie, you don't want it to just be happiness all the way through. There's always a twist, a challenge, 
a problem that comes up, they have to overcome some kind of adversity to reach the happy ending. Yeah. And it's kind of that kind of thing, isn't it? That, yeah, there's, there is a twist, there is a, a challenge, but overall it's, it's good. And the, the full moons are like a culmination. They show us, they're like a, a culmination and a fruition time. They show us what's growing in the garden and what will grow and come and fruit and seed and what crops might fail or what plants might fail. So in our own lives, in our projects or in our daily lives, we see what's working and what isn't. It's like the illumination in the same way that the moon is fully illuminated in our own lives, things are fully illuminated. So it's again, the things where it affects in the chart around that 24, 21 degrees of Aries mm. and Libra and the cardinal signs. So Cancer and Capricorn, those are the areas most intensely affected, but also all of the cardinal signs will be the ones most affected by this. Would you agree? I feel like we've had a lot of um, cardinal activity. We certainly have, yeah. And because it's Aries, we've got the rule of Mars as well. Um, but that's in a cardinal sign, so we're really not moving off that cardinal axis for this one. No. At all. Unless, of course, you bring in the exaltation ruler, or Libra which is Saturn in Pisces. And of course, the exaltation ruler for Aries is the sun, and that's staying in the cardinal Libra. So Saturn in Pisces is the only exception to the rule, bringing in some mutable energy there. And again, Saturn is retrograde, so he's going back over, looking back over his notes about what he is dreaming up in, in the ethereal realms, the ethereal realms of Pisces. Are you ready to move on? We've got Venus in Sagittarius. Would you like to take us away with that? Venus has been out of exile and out of the opposition with Uranus, which is nice. She's moved into an opposition with Jupiter, who is in exile as well. It's also put her into a square with Saturn, who is in her exaltation. Venus moving into Sagittarius. Sagittarius is a mutable sign. It's yang, it's outgoing energy, fiery energy. And in Sagittarius, Venus is peregrine. So she's like a wanderer. She doesn't have any essential dignity. She is the bound ruler when she gets to the second bound. Um, but that will only be for a short while. So it's, it's not significant. I think that's from the 27th to the 1st of October. So she can see the sign that she rules in Libra by sextile. So she can see the sun now. So that's, that's giving her some say back over what the sun is, is getting up to. But she can't now see Taurus over here. That leaves Uranus unsupervised. So it's like we give with one hand and we take away with the other, unless the moon has sight, because the moon is the co-ruler. And on this ingress, it's like the ingress kind of carries the energy for the whole of the transit. And the moon doesn't have sight either. Um, the moon is the exaltation ruler of Taurus. So at the moment, we do see Uranus left unsupervised. So yes, as you said, she's going to square Saturn and Neptune. She will try and Chiron and the North Node here as she moves through this transit she will be sextiling the sun and the south node so there might be some release as she she's not too far away from the south node so she'll be moving into that quite early so there might be some release there those sextiles are usually a little less palpable too so it's you know see uh lighter traffic on the drive home or you know and then she said she's she's going to be opposite jupiter in in gemini so like it's going to be the mutable signs that will feel this but also potentially the fixed because of lack of access a lack of sight there to taurus potentially but i would say mainly the mutable signs so sagittarius jupiter in gemini as the opposition and then the squares, certainly the Venus-Saturn square, which will come first. And then the Venus-Neptune square. And then Virgo, which currently doesn't have any anyone there. 
So those are the signs that might feel it. Is there anything you wanted to add with that, Shona? I'm really curious what the Venus Saturn square is going to bring us. But there aren't really any archetypes coming to mind. Oh, that was that's my Jane Eyre archetype. That is my um, Mister Mister Rochester and and burning the house down before you can confess your love. He has to go blind and like all that time that they spent together when everything was fine, but everything had to literally be in ashes and and. And he was blind and everything before they could finally admit their feelings to each other. There was love there that it had to reach that stage. So, yeah, to me, Venus Saturn is is the junior archetype of of the love being there, but it it takes its time to to be declared and to be seen. And it's going to go through trials and tribulations before it emerges. So I think Jane Eyre sort of totally <laughs> encapsulates the Venus Saturn journey. Yeah. I don't know if there's a modern equivalent. Um, I mean, I, I love the fact that we've got chaos now and that that gives us modern characters, contemporary characters to use that people might not relate to Jane Eyre or be aware of it, but might have caught chaos on Netflix. And of course, Saturn. But no. Um, I'm thinking of Hades and Pluto. There wasn't a Saturn either. Would have been the father of Zeus. So he wasn't actually a character, but it's alluded to that that he wasn't a good father, to say the least. I guess. Kind of created the character flaws that we see in Zeus, uh, kind of a, a response to the mothering and fathering that he received. And then again, Venus isn't. I really want to have gone off on this tangent. No, I mean, Hopefully there'll be a second series and we'll see. Yeah, it was really good. But um, the Hera and, uh, was it the Hera and uh, Jupiter mm -hmm. storyline? Hera and Zeus or Poseidon? Hera. Oh, the Hera Poseidon storyline. That's what it was. In secret, delayed gratification, large, large feelings, but not really professed publicly yeah mm. yes cool. yeah that's kind of Venus Saturn isn't it yeah well you've also got Neptune still there so mm. it's got the flavor it's actually casting an eye over it what are you saying about me yeah yeah don't forget I'm here yeah yeah he comes across so serious to me but um so it's hard to see him as as the character that he he appeared at that, yeah, I did love it. So we've got the sun in Scorpio. Do you want to take us away with the sun's ingress to Scorpio? So with the sun in Scorpio, we've got it co-present now with Mercury again. Mercury is moving quickly through Scorpio. So whatever those messages are, they're going to come quickly, hard and fast, I think. With the sun moving into Scorpio too, then we end up with that Saturn sun, or yeah, Saturn sun trine. And then we've got, is that a third quarter moon coming there and a square to Mars as well? So we're going to have a lot, a lot of contacts when the sun moves into Scorpio. Yeah. October suddenly feels like a very big month, not as big as August, but he suddenly feels like a very active month. I find it interesting that all the contacts are happening, or many of them are happening in water. A lot of water trines happening, which makes me think it's going to be very, um, I think it's a little cliche to say emotional, but we've got the moon coming home. We've got Mars still in, you know, fall, trying to work out those issues. And I think we saw that, that Mars sun square previously, didn't we? So we're going to see that a little different flavor of that again. Yeah. And when Mars reaches Leo, it'll square the sun again. Yeah, it sometimes happens that you see a square two or three times. Yeah, there's always, when there's those um, Sun-Saturn contacts, there's always those uh, larger-than-life figures or, you know, those real prominent figureheads that come into play too. Yeah, and I should have said this is on the 22nd of October that the sun ingresses into Scorpio, her present with Mercury. So this is fixed water. So I always think of like... um swamp water or like a hot steaming bath or a hot tub or something where it's contained yeah. in some way as opposed to an ocean or a river that's free-flowing. Mm. Sure. 
so it's water that's restricted in some way and it's interesting because it's the moon's fall but the sun will also be in its decan in the second decan uh, so just on a personal note when the sun reaches that second decan i've i've written for the astrologers co-op on that decan so i went really deep into the significations when the sun reaches there that will be published so i'm quite excited about that and thought quite deeply about the significations of the moon being in fall the sun and the co-ruler being the sun a fallen moon the ruler being mars and the sun and jupiter being the two life-giving planets mm. with venus as a bound ruler and mercury you know and how do they all interact They're imagining them all gathering in a space with the moon a little bit dejected and they're all just trying to cheer cheer the moon up and get her spark back because because we all need her to do her job because the moon brings our transmissions down to earth communicates with the earth from the planet so so yeah the sun has an important job to do there in scorpio too and um, kind of lights up what's in those waters for us those that intensity of scorpio i know it's kind of like a modern interpretation we assign it as the favorable place of pluto mm -hmm. And kind of then associate it with Hades and all those places. But the the idea of the intensity does stick with Scorpio. And with all st fixed signs, they have that staying power. So that there's an element of stability um, and I suppose a degree of intensity because when they start a task, they're going to see it through. Um, the sun here is mostly peregrine. Um, until it reaches that second decan. So that's why that second decan is important. And these decans are usually, I say usually, for the sun, they're 10 days because it's a 10, 10 degree um, division. And the sun, of course, is consistent in how it travels. For the other planets, you can't always work it out so evenly. But for the sun, it's a lot easier to work it out. So it'll be 10 days within Mars's. Deccan and then 10 days in the sun and then 10 days in Venus. Yeah. There's some nice trine. Mars, as you've already said. And that second Deccan is about dual distillation and I called it sacred trust. I put here, it's trying the Cancer moon. Yum. But that's a nice sign for the ingress is that because the ingress carries the signature for the rest of the transit, it's just really nice there that we've got Although the sun is in a peregrine place, you have the other luminary is home in its domicile and it has a trine aspect. And it's actually speaking directly to Mercury, it's co-present. So just like it when the moon is in a nice place, even though the moon is in fall in Scorpio, the moon in this transit chart is looking on that sign from a nice place of power um, and comfort. So it's able to support the sun and the moon is obviously the triplicity ruler yeah, of the sun and Mercury as well. So it's able to lend support to the sun while it's in that position of being peregrine and a wanderer without much help. That was everything I had. Was there anything you wanted to add, Shauna? I feel like the moon is maybe definitely going to feel a bit more empowered once reaching cancer uh, during this cycle. It's at the point where it's, you know, it's, past the full moon phase. So it's really sharing what it's learned along the way so far. You're seeing some of those things come to fruition, you know, and I wonder how that will look when the moon, I mean, the moon's pretty close to, to Mars there already, co-present in the sign. I wonder if the moon's going to find strength with Mars there, you know, maybe feeling a little more sure-footed, a little less emotional, you know, since Mars has already made its way through a lot of that cancer journey. Um, I mean, we know it's going to go retrograde shortly after reaching Leo, but I just keep thinking maybe um, that moon sun trine is going to feel a lot more sure footed, even though it's in water, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's really got yeah. Mars there as a protector, isn't it? And as an advocator and um, an energizer and a motivator. Yeah. A little more of a backbone, you know? Yeah, it's really nice, especially when it's coming up to this opposition with Pluto. Kind of um, someone to fight with. It's always better when you've got somebody on your side, isn't it? Yeah. 
especially when they're strong, you know, like Mars is. Yeah. Okay. That's not particularly strong in cancer. That's because it's learning about all the cancer significations that are not yeah. natural to Mars, but the moon's able to help with that. The moon's able to teach Mars how to be more emotive and intuitive and into the fields of things that Mars just doesn't operate in that world. It's more used to just taking action immediately. Mm. And the moon well, slow down, let's think about this, let's, how do we feel about this? Should we talk about this? And learning the strength and feeling those emotions too. Yeah. In, in facing and, and in processing them. Processing, yes. Yeah. yeah that's really nice. And, and of course the sun's going to be bringing them up. Mercury's giving you the opportunity to be spoken. And that concludes the third week in October. So we will be back next week with the 23rd to the 30th of October. Um, I'm Sonia from Celestial Astrology. And thank you so much to Shauna for joining me. Would you like to remind people where to find you? Yep. I'm Shauna with Smart Astro. Uh, on the interwebs, it's smartastro.com. Don't try to find me in person. Uh, the same handle on Instagram, Twitter, and Substack. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks. Thank you so much for joining us for the weekly forecast. You often hear creators ask you, could you please like and subscribe? And I can't emphasize enough how important it is for small channels. It really does make the difference. And also we all want to reach the audience that our content is made for and we can do this with your help if you've enjoyed it it gives us immediate feedback on what you're enjoying and what you would like more of it doesn't cost you anything and it's a great way for you to support our work and just let us know that you're enjoying what we're doing so if you have enjoyed this content through to the end and you'd like us to keep making it and make more of it that's a great way for you to let us know so whatever wherever you're watching this please do give us a thumbs up and give us your support and we really appreciate it. Thank you so much.